In the criminal justice system, philosophically based offenses are considered socially threatening. In ancient Greece, local property owners prosecuting these abstract felonies are members of an elite squad serving as both judge and jury. These are their stories. Dun dun! Socrates is infuriating to the winners of the ancient Greek system. Those born into education with parents that had marketable skills, who eventually became landowners, voters, and democratic leaders in ancient Greece. And when Socrates throws wrenches in their system with his deep thoughts, questioning their values in justice, a good way of life, he's like, that doesn't mean that you're a good leader or that coming to have owned property means anything other than exactly that. Socrates says that power does not inherently make you more wise or actually give you any legitimate authority other than the obvious you're taking it because you're in charge. The ideas like this start sprouting in the minds of ancient Greece's youth. And it puts the whole way of life for the Greek economy and the democratically elected leaders of ancient Greece, it puts their work in jeopardy when people recognize that they don't actually know what they're talking about. As soon as the youth start to think this way and grow up and start participating in van lives for themselves, landowners, their property loses value and their slaves start running away. And their children aren't willing to upkeep the lifestyle they planned for them. The assumption that these ancient Gre Grecians were going to have to, you know, work a 40 hour work week to upkeep the land. And suddenly Socrates is there saying that they don't have to. And that the only person saying that's right is the person saying it. No matter what society or culture you live in. You have to make your money by impressing and selling to those who already have it. And van life is about being true to yourself and not selling to those who have money. It's easier to maintain money than it is to earn it. And neither mean that you actually have good judgment on anything other than the system or society that you're trading money in. Democratically elected leaders in ancient Athens, who all happened to be wealthy property owners, didn't like the idea that they didn't earn their position of power and they didn't earn the land that gave them the only right to vote. Keep in mind that in ancient Greece, not only is money and land something you inherit, it's also the thing that gives you the right to vote. And Socrates was pushing back at that ideologically, you know, showing people that slaves could think ideas too, and spreading his ideas to cool surfer kids and progressive intellectuals all over Greece that their system of inheriting land and the right to vote is not necessarily a great democracy. Socrates' real point is that each moment is new, and in each moment, we know nothing. But this strong belief has a lot of implications for how people see their choices and view themselves. Because a lot of people's identity is tied up into the land that they own and the votes that they cast. But Socrates and those who really live van life know that we're all just guessing. And you're either eating the weird government cheese or you're not. Hello, what's good, and welcome to part two of the van life and death of Socrates. I'm your host, John Gavin, and I hope you enjoyed that cold open. In pursuit of knowledge, Socrates said a lot of stuff and came to a lot of spiritual realizations or arguments. Some of the finer points that he made in his travels, though, that he used to convince others of his new beliefs 
you know, that they know nothing. Socrates was talking to a very religious community and group of people. Maybe he was religious. Maybe he was framing it for religious people. I don't know. But he explained his beliefs in how the world works like this. He says, first and foremost, our souls are immortal and they exist before our lives and after our deaths. They're eternal. It's just our bodies here that end. All right. Um, I feel like most people are on board, most religions anyway, on board with that. And then he says, we're born after we exist as souls in the spirit world before this one. So if we're, if we exist before this flesh, we got to be somewhere. And that place, my friend is the spirit world. He calls it the world of forms or, um, yeah, the shadow, whatever the cave. I don't know. I like spirit world the best because it reminds me of the content I consume. So he says, okay, point number three, that in the spirit world, that's where God and math and objects and ideas and things that exist in our plane, they're cast here physically, just like us. Like our souls are this eternal magic thing, but yet we're right here right now. And then it's only a sliver of our entire soul, which exists through time in the fourth dimension. But Socrates didn't talk about the fourth dimension. That's me inserting that. But so he's like, okay, so there's the spirit world where there's everything and it's awesome. And an example, he says, you, my friend, just have one shitty dining room table in your living room. And the spirit world has the, it's literally every great dining room table that's ever existed and the knowledge of bad tables too, so that that doesn't happen. Like you can't even fathom the perfect table because your dining room table is just a fraction of it. When we learn essential truths, like what a good table looks like, you know, it's not wobbly and it ain't ugly. It's a good table or what a good person looks like when some, we see someone do something good and we're like, oh, that's a good person. We just know. And when we see, you know, we just can see two and two is four. There's some things, a square has four sides that you just, it's just a logical truth that you recognize. It's as if you remember it. And Socrates says that you remember things like this from the spirit world because you were there before you were born, but that we can only remember things from the spirit world. If we see things in real life that remind us. So like if a slave is never shown math, they're not going to remember how to do math. It's a little out there. These ideas were essential and foundational to van life because people who live in the van life travel and they meet lots of different people. Sometimes they're poor. Sometimes, you know, they're different colors. They're different genders. They're different language speakers. It's like, there's all kinds of people out there. And Socrates with his argument was saying that we all have souls. We're all people and we can all learn. And yet we also all know nothing. So there's that for you. I haven't talked about Plato yet, but Plato is one of the main authors who wrote content starring Socrates. People consider Plato's work to be the most canon, kind of like everyone considers the Marvel Cinematic Universe to be the most canon, you know, Spider-Man uh, Avengers movies. Plato was the most canon writer and producer of content about Socrates. Plato wrote about Socrates like a pre-Jesus, like seriously, the coolest dude teaching everyone about the spirit world and wearing a toga, walking around in sandals and preaching about virtue and life and knowledge. But whereas Socrates mostly hung out with rich people and didn't really stick up for slaves all that much, Jesus was a lot cooler when it comes to like women's rights and advocating for healthcare and stuff like that. So um, maybe we should do a Jesus episode. That would be kind of fun. But just like Jesus, uh, Socrates in content has been used to push an agenda throughout history and in our institutions. It's important to understand that this guy, Plato, who was actually one of Socrates' disciples, one of his students, eventually became his main producer. And Plato and others at their network, which they called the Academy, had an agenda. 
and it's one that I don't think Socrates would stand by, where the most canon Socrates comes from Plato and the Academy. He Socrates actually lived a van lifestyle and was against institutionalized knowledge. So Plato and having a network of knowledge producers, I think, is really against Socrates' brand and the philosophy behind van life in general. But Plato starts taking advantage of Socrates' platform and his audience and starts totally trying to push an ancient utopian communist agenda through Socrates' like mouth, where the philosopher kings are the ones in charge. And it just so happens Plato starts the very first academy that trains philosopher kings. You know, um, finger on chin, taking a huge dump, and look to your right, there's no toilet paper. My statements about that are a little controversial um, when in the philosophy world, but if you listen and you hear what Socrates is saying about his fundamental values, it's real easy to sort out the bullshit. And also, please appreciate that there's not a lot of forensic evidence, and this actually took place like 2,500 years ago. We will be talking more about Plato's utopia and how he pretty much wanted 1984 to happen coming up soon. Anyway, in his limited series and stage adaptations of Socrates' life, when Socrates isn't spewing propaganda about, about a utopian revolution, he's inventing and refining the ideas that created the van life philosophy we know and love today. It highlights that we all know nothing that's absolutely true of the good life, and that we have to find what's true for ourselves in our individual experiences and through the tables that we see and make. Socrates thinks that the unexamined life is not worth living, and that's the one where you just listen to what other people say, read their books, drive on their highways, go to their buildings, and think what you're told. You're not examining the slice of life that God's giving you. You know, choose the path through the forest illuminated by light, and you may find somewhere cool, but when you are just looking down, following someone else's footsteps, you're going to miss the view. Van life is about finding how to live and not giving your life to learning about someone else's rules because they don't know the truth either. It's just a best guess. They can't be predicted like we all want to live our lives in predictable ways. And the good life promised to ancient Grecians by their democratically elected government, it turns out, well, Socrates believes that it's an empty one and that people miss out on the valuable life lessons that they can learn shared with compassion and understanding in new groups with different dynamics, with different values and hierarchy, hierarchies. But no one will ever be able to show you, you know, the full spreadsheet because they're always going to be trying to convince you of what's best from their perspective, and they're limited to their slice and the slices they listen to. But democratically elected leaders admitting that they don't know what's best and right also leads to the conclusion that maybe they don't deserve as much power as they have. So they're trapped being that I know what's right person by fear of falling. Fear of van life. Socrates steadily gains followers and becomes famous. Lots of rich and powerful people hang out with him because they feel like they can buy the van life and learn from it. And they can, to an extent, when really they're investing in Socrates' brand and spreading his message. He continues having probing discussions with influential people about their ideas of justice and telling them that they're wrong and that explaining to them why they know nothing, the lowest of the low, and women can learn and have spirits that transcend. Ancient Greek democratically elected leaders saw their power threatened because Socrates was persuading the hip, cool, young van life people 
to not invest their land and their resources of government of governing in to the democratically elected politicians. They were beginning to see that the system wasn't perfect and ask new questions for themselves. It's a status trip to remove yourself from the sins and flaws of those around you while keeping all of the benefits that the society has gifted you. And just like that, you want to go just camping in the Garden of Gethsemane or Yosemite State Park with a bunch of homies who also think that drinking and burning bush is super fun. But while you're doing that, you're not investing your time or your work or any of the, you know, resources that you've been given back into your community, like hospital workers or researchers or teachers. Actually, I mean, ideally, everyone who has a job is contributing to society and is enabling someone else to live a better life by contributing to this group and the resources that we all share. Plus, you get to help pave roads and get the hospital grants by paying taxes and letting the democratically elected leaders decide what to do with your money for everyone. Wink, wink. Socrates is not making himself any use to these elected leaders. He's starting to change the decisions that the inheritees of wealth are making with their money. And that's upsetting the economic order of ancient Greece. The well-off popular kids who are bored, you know, they just work out in the gymnasium and talk philosophy all day. They go home to their land owning and voting dads and start pulling sass with them and rejecting their way of life and their decisions or whatever. I don't actually know for sure what they were inspired to say to their parents, but I'm sure that it was a mixture of what Socrates told them and childhood resentment. Regardless, the parents did not like it. And though Socrates didn't actually even write anything down himself, in the year 399 BC, his words and his actions would finally catch up with him and he would be arrested for charges of corrupting the youth and denying the gods. I'm going to go brew some tea for this next part. Bum bum. Camera's up on Socrates, and he's about to address the courtroom, and he begins. He opens by telling his accusers that they're fake, they don't know shit, they don't even know that they don't know shit, and that they are putting him on trial based on rumors. He is a free man, and he denies the fact that his ideas are bad because the god Apollo and the oracle Delphi once told him that he is the smartest man alive for admitting that he knows nothing. He says that he didn't know that preaching in sandals was illegal and that somebody better tell Jesus or they're going to crucify him too. And then Socrates goes on to say, I see you politicians pretending you know better and then screw driving us all in the butt. I just showed some teens that their dads have small dicks and how to think for themselves. And now all you conservative Democrat snowflakes from ancient Greece are upset that I was providing free childcare and teaching your kids how to think for themselves. I'm a nice guy. I try to show the unwise their ways are bad. It's a public service. He goes, I'm literally over here just asking man, what's it mean to be virtuous and given free love and live in the van lifestyle and y'all cramp it because your teenagers are getting sassy. You are all so caught up in the system and the government that you're not reflecting on what it means to live a good life and to be virtuous and to interact with others in a good, positive way, no matter who they are. Admit that you're not sure what the right thing to do is and just earnestly try and figure it out because it's not about the values given to you. It's about discovering how they apply in your own slice of it life brush your teeth eat your greens exercise think about your actions and then the judge and jury have some you know angry stories about some half-baked reason they see their freedom being limited by their children's self-expression 
And if you'd like an example, you can just see what's happening in Florida right now. And then Socrates steps off his soapbox a little bit and is like, and by the way, part two, you're charging me with denying the gods, atheism. I believe in the gods. Apollo literally told the Oracle and me that I'm the best and that no one should fear death because of the gods. I believe in Apollo. I did right by him my whole life and the whole way. So he's got my back in death. As long as I keep doing my thing, playing your devil's advocate, none of this matters. And the desperate part is, you know, he leans in. He's like, history will decide which one of us is right. He learned that the man does not approve of the van. The man will kill you for speaking your truth seeing and acting in a way that isn't conducive to keeping them in power. If you challenge the institution strong enough, even the privileged of the van life are not safe. Socrates was found guilty and sentenced to death by poison. And that's Dick Wolf, baby. I'm John Gavin, and I hope to see you next time, even though this is an audio podcast. Stay tuned for our sources, and if you enjoyed our time together, please use the calories in your fingers to create some positive energy by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. It really makes a huge impact on the algorithm for us. Today's sources include the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and an article in it by Deborah Nails. Lectures by Dr. Kevin Hill. Lectures by Dr. Albert Spencer. Wikipedia. Urban Dictionary. Plato's Apology. Plato's Mino. And of course, Saturday Night Live. Catch you later.